If you've watched my other videos, you know that one of the things that we're always on the lookout for are Old Testament quotations or allusions that we find in the Gospels. Because what the evangelists are doing when they use these is they're sending us back to the Old Testament. They're saying, hey, stop for a minute. I want you to go check out this Old Testament quote and then the context around it and then come back and then look at what I'm talking about here in the Gospels. Well, we're going to see an example today from Mark chapter 1, the first eight verses, of where Mark barely lets us in the door of his gospel before he stops us and says, hey, hey, before you come into my gospel, I want you to run back into the house of the Old Testament. And there's several rooms I want you to check out in the Old Testament and then come back and we'll talk more about Jesus. But here's where things get a little bit both confusing as well as cool. Mark says he's quoting from Isaiah. But is he? Well, yes and no. He's quoting from Isaiah to be sure, but he's also quoting from Malachi. And Malachi is reworking a verse from the book of Exodus. So we barely get two verses into the gospel of Mark before we have to leave Mark's gospel and go back to the house of the Old Testament and investigate the room of Exodus and the room of Malachi and the room of Isaiah. And then, once we've kind of checked that out, we can come back to Mark, and we can go into the house of that gospel, and we can figure out exactly what he's wanting us to see. And actually, to give it away beforehand, what Mark is wanting us to see is that the ministry of Jesus, everything he does, is best understood as God bringing to fulfillment the new exodus that he promised over and over in prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, and Hosea, and others. So Mark is wanting us to see by going back to the Old Testament that what Jesus is up to is Jesus is here to exodus, not just Israel, but to exodus the world, to bring to fulfillment this promise of a new cosmopolitan exodus in which God is going to bring all people back home to himself. Okay, so that's some pretty cool stuff we have to get to. But let's first of all just take a quick look at the opening verse of Mark's gospel before we get to this Old Testament quotation. Mark starts out his gospel this way, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, if we knew our Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, we would recognize right away that that word RK, beginning, is also the word used in the opening of Genesis, in RK, in the beginning. So, maybe Mark as the other evangelist, maybe Mark is wanting us already to hear in his opening word the second word of the Old Testament, beginning. Certainly the other gospel writers do this. If you look at Matthew's gospel, he starts out his gospel with the two Greek words, biblos genesios, which could be translated the book of the Genesis of. Of course, Genesis, we think, first book of the Bible. Mark uses the word RK. John, we're probably most familiar with, he starts out his gospel in RK in the beginning, which is the exact two Greek words that the Old Testament starts with in RK in the beginning, God created. And then Luke does something interesting as well. In Luke's gospel, at the end of his genealogy, at the end of chapter 3, he gives us these words, which all would have been kind of squeezed together in Greek. There were no gaps between the words back when people wrote Greek at that time. So it would look like this in English of Adam, of God. And the Genesis 4 opened with, opens with the word Jesus. So if you were, if you were reading the, the Greek in the original, you would have seen of Adam, of God, Jesus, all kind of squeezed there together. This is Luke's way of taking us back to the book of Genesis in order that we might understand that if we're going to really, if we're going to get who Jesus is and what he's about, we can't do that without thinking about his work in terms of his recreation of the world, his regenesis of the world in himself. So anyway, that's the opening verse. Let's get to this quotation. So uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 2 says this, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, interesting little tidbit, Mark refers to the Old Testament 69 times in his gospel, and 19 of those, 28% of those, are from Isaiah. So Isaiah is a major book for Mark's understanding of the Messiah. Now, let's let's ask and answer the question, 
which exactly, which book is, is Mark referring to? He says Isaiah, and sure, he refers to Isaiah, but there's more than just Isaiah here. There's also Malachi, and there's also Exodus. So let's take a quick look at each of those. First of all, from Malachi chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, my, in Hebrew that would be Malach, I send my Malach, my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then, if you go back to Exodus chapter 23, this is God speaking. This is after the whole debacle with the golden calf. This is God speaking to Moses and Israel. And he says, Behold, I send a Malach, a messenger, before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. So that's Exodus 23, 20. Now, you go to Isaiah 40, and you read this. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, what Mark does is he kind of picks and pulls from all of these, and he kind of molds them together into this one particular quotation. Now, we could spend literally hours kind of un packing this and, and going into the, the significance of each of these passages. What I want to do is I just want to focus on three particular aspects of this combined, uh, this composite quotation that Mark put forward. So it's kind of to, to at least explain a little bit of what's going on here. First of all, he talks about my messenger. So my malach in, in the Hebrew. So in in Exodus chapter 23, this messenger, this Moloch, which is sometimes translated as angel, this is a reference to the Moloch Adonai, the Moloch Yahweh, the messenger of the Lord in the Old Testament. This is the unique messenger that bears God's name in himself. So Exodus says that, God says in Exodus that he puts his name in this messenger. My name is in him. That means that God puts his essence in his very self into who this messenger is, which is why this particular passage from Exodus has, has been understood as a reference to the Son of God. He's the messenger of the Father. God's name is in him. That is to say he is of the same essence as the Father. So this messenger that the Father sends back in Exodus chapter 20, at 23 to bring Israel into the promised land is none other than the one that he will eventually send to become incarnate, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's Exodus. That's my messenger. But this is reworked later on. Malachi takes this, and he uses the messenger to talk about John the Baptist. So John the Baptist is the one who is going to be there to prepare the way for the coming of this Son of God. He's the one who is sent to get everything ready for his advent on the scene. So the my messenger has an interesting history all the way from referring to the, the Messiah in Exodus 23 to the Messiah's precursor, the one who prepares his way in the book of Malachi. So that's the first, first thing I want to unpack from these, these particular verses. The second one is in the wilderness. What's the significance of the wilderness? Well, in the Old Testament mind, the wilderness was the place where God had taken his people and was bringing them and forming them and shaping them to be those who would inherit the promised land. Of course, they spend 40 years in the wilderness. That wasn't the original plan, but that's how long they ended up spending there. The wilderness was a place of preparation. God brought Israel out of enslavement. He brought them into the wilderness. He gave them his covenant. He gave them his sacrifices. They built the tabernacle while they were in the wilderness. The wilderness was a place where God was active in the life of his people in order to ready them for entry into the promised land. So, it's, it's, no, it's no mere insignificant detail that John is in the wilderness proclaiming this baptism of repentance. Why does he go to the wilderness? Because he's the guy who gets Israel ready. He's the one who is preparing them for this new exodus that the Messiah himself is going to accomplish. So John the Baptist could not have preached on the street corner. He could not have preached inside a building. He was not a temple guy. John the Baptist goes into the wilderness in order there to make ready the people of God for the coming exodus that is going to take place when the Messiah comes. So that's the significance of in the wilderness. Thirdly, he goes to prepare the way of the Lord. 
Now, this is very significant because you see what's happening in Mark's gospel. Mark quotes this, quotes a section from Isaiah. Now, in Isaiah, you prepare the way of Yahweh. That's the translation. That's the Hebrew behind the Lord here. Now, to whom is this applied in Mark's gospel? Well, who, who is the Lord that John the Baptist is preparing the way for? It's Jesus. So you see what's going on here already. At the beginning of Mark's gospel, Mark is saying to you, hey, look at Isaiah, look at Malachi, look at Exodus, look at all these together and realize that the one I'm talking about here, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as he's already called him in verse 1, isn't just the Messiah and he isn't just the Son of God. He is Yahweh. So Mark is already giving a full divine status. He's making sure there's no mistakes. You want to know who Jesus is? Well, he's Yahweh, period, full stop. He's telling you this via this quotation from Isaiah chapter 40. So John the Baptist, this messenger that Malachi talks about, he comes to prepare the way for Yahweh. And this Yahweh is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So there's so much of this this, this Christology, this teaching about Christ, it's, it's compressed into these opening verses of Mark's gospel. Mark wants to make sure that you know who this person is. And he does it in an Old Testament sort of way by applying an Old Testament quotation about Yahweh to the Messiah whom he is about to introduce in the verses that follow. So, what else can we say, can we say about this Isaiah chapter 40 uh, particular reference? Well, a couple things. Number one, Isaiah 40 is, is Isaiah 40, 40 introduces a crucial part of the book of Isaiah that's all about the second exodus, the, the climactic exodus that God is going to accomplish by means of the servant whom he is going to send. The same servant that we hear about in chapter, in chapter 53 of Isaiah, the one who is persecuted, the one who is stricken and smitten and bears all of our griefs and all of our sins. So this servant in Isaiah chapter 40 through 55, through the chapters that follow that, the servant is one who is going to accomplish the will of God. He's going to bring the people home from the four corners of the earth. He's going to institute this great worldwide exodus in which he's going to bring the scattered people of God home into the kingdom which Yahweh is going to establish. That defines the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is all about repatriation, bringing home God's children from their land of exile. He's bringing us home from death to life. He's bringing us from darkness to light. He is gathering the scattered people of God in this new and greater exodus that Isaiah had described centuries before. So by quoting Isaiah 40, Mark is telling us, when you want to understand the ministry of Jesus, you look at it as an exodus ministry. That's what the work of Christ is all about. He's conquering evil. He's bringing people by means of water, think of John the Baptist, into his kingdom in order that they might be with him, under him as the sheep of him who is the shepherd sent by God. Now, interestingly, the Dead Sea Scrolls community understood Isaiah 40 to be talking about themselves. They actually thought that they had gone out into the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord as well. So we, we have this quotation from the rule of the community that says this. This is the sectarians talking about the, the people who were part of the Qumran community. It says the sectarians are to be segregated from within the dwelling of the men of sin. So the, the people that God had rejected, the, the, their fellow Jews that they rejected as not walking in the way of the Lord. So they are to be segregated from them to walk to the wilderness in order to open there his path. As it is written, and here they quote Isaiah 40, In the desert prepare a, the way of the Lord. Straighten in the step a roadway for our God. This is the study of the law which he commanded through the hand of Moses. So that's from the rule of the community. It's, it's fascinating because it shows that at the same time that Mark was writing his gospel, or about the same time that Mark was writing his gospel, there was another Jewish group, a sectarian group, living out in the wilderness, in the desert, and they thought that Isaiah 40 was all about them. 
They thought that this, this is what they were doing. They were getting everything ready for the coming of God by living these holy and clean lives. At least they thought they were holy and clean lives in order to get ready for this eschatological coming of, of God. Now, they were wrong, of course, but the very fact that they understood Isaiah 40 that way kind of gives us another another uh, insight into the mind of the first century Jews and how they were reading Isaiah, how they were reading prophecies about what God was going to accomplish in the wilderness. Okay, well, let's move on. We, uh, after, after this discussion in verse 4, Mark says this, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, the question that ought to arise is, why the Jordan? Now, I mentioned earlier that John could not be preaching on the street corner or inside a building. He had to be in the wilderness. That was the way, that was the place where he prepared the way for the Lord. Well, why was he specifically in the wilderness at the Jordan River? Because the Jordan River was that point that separated the wilderness from the promised land. It was this kind of liminal space where Israel went from being the people about to enter into the people who had entered, the people of Moses to the people of Joshua. So the Jordan River was the place where God really accomplished a second parting of the Red Sea. He parted the Jordan River just like he'd parted the Red Sea so that his people could pass over, thus proving that he had now given to them a fulfillment of that which he had promised. And that was really kind of the, in many ways, the end of the Exodus when they finally crossed from the wilderness to the promised land. John goes to the Jordan River to baptize there because what's his, what's his goal? What's his ministry? He is preparing people for the new Exodus. So he's like Moses, he's like Elijah, he's like Joshua, he's kind of like all of these particular Old Testament people in one way or another, and that he's getting them ready for, the, for, the, for another crossing, if you will, for a new exodus that is about to be accomplished by the work of the Messiah. So he had to bring them to the Jordan River because the Jordan River was that boundary between promise and reality. And so John prepares them for the coming reality that we see in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, why was, you might wonder, why was John kind of weird in the way that he was? Well, how did John look the way that he did? Why was he dressed the way he was? Well, let's compare what we have in the Gospel of Mark with what we see in the Old Testament. So, in Mark's Gospel, it says that John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. Now, if you compare that with what we have in 2 Kings chapter 1, a description of Elijah, you realize that John was purposely dressing the way that he was in order to make sure that people knew that he was the prophet. He was the prophet like Elijah. Because in 2 Kings chapter 1, we read, He said to them, What kind of man was he who came out to meet you and told you these things? And they answered him, Well, he wore a garment of hair and had a leather belt of leather about his waist. And he said, Oh, it's Elijah the Tishbite. So Elijah dressed this way. John imitated that in his own dress to make sure that people would pick up on the fact that he was the new Elijah. He was the one actually that Malachi had talked about in chapter 4, this Elijah who was to come. And of course, Jesus makes that explicit later in Mark's gospel in chapter 9 that John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come to prepare the way for him. Now, John says something about his, his lowliness in the verse that follows. So let's talk just for a second about that. John says, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What John is describing here is the fact that he is not worthy even to perform the most, most servile of duties. We know from some later Jewish literature that even Jewish servants were not forced to stoop down and untie the, 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 the shoes, the sandals of their master. That was considered to be like way too low for a Jewish servant to perform. So what John is saying is he's not even worthy. He's not worthy to do like the lowest of the lowest of the servile task 
for this one who's coming after him. So this is John's way of expressing, of course, not just his humility, his lowliness, but how strong and how glorious and how mighty is the one who's coming. He is preparing the way for. So this is John's way of making sure that we realize this is no, this is not a, no mere regular rabbi. This is, this is not just another teacher sent by God. This is, in fact, God, the Son of God. This is Yahweh. This is, the, this is that divine messenger way back in Exodus chapter 23 who is now coming to bring to fulfillment all these Old Testament promises. And he's going to do this through his ministry of exodusing the world. And, of course, that exodus takes place throughout its ministry, but especially in his death and resurrection, in which he himself is exiled into the land of darkness and death. And then he's brought back. He's brought back in the resurrection to the land of light and life in order that he might draw all people to himself in his death and then bring them through his life and death and resurrection into the promises of God, into a land, into a kingdom that he has established by his own ministry of suffering and death. But right away in Mark's gospel, he tells us that's what Jesus is up to. Right away, he says, okay, I want you to read Isaiah. I want you to read Malachi. I want you to read Exodus and thus know that's what the ministry of the the Messiah is going to be all about. He is going to Exodus the world. Okay. I hope that's been helpful to you. Uh, A lot of cool stuff going on here with all the the prophecies referred to. And uh, I I hope that it's kind of opened up this passage for you so you can better understand it. God's peace be with each of you. And I pray that you may have a, a, a great week as you live in the mercy and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. As always, thanks for watching.